Hello, hello. Thanks for coming in today. Oh, thank you. Uh, sorry, sorry if I seem a little spacey and like I'm just kind of like staring off at walls or whatever right now. Hmm. Yeah, I I kind of had noticed that uh, you seem a little bit more, a little bit more withdrawn, uh, maybe a little bit triggered by by something or other. And I, you know, we we don't have to rush anything. I was just hoping maybe you'd want to. Uh, oh, it's just you know I'm I'm thinking a lot about how like you know things things from the past can kind of live on uh, for many, you know, for like a really long time. And like, you know, these, these images that like you, you remember when you were younger, uh, you know, kind of propagate on and become like distorted with time or even just like in the moment, like with emotion and fear. Right. Uh, and just like how scary and encroaching that can be. Um. Like, you know, like when you're watching, say, a critically acclaimed horror film called Skinema Rink, and then halfway through, there's the most YouTube ass jump scare I've seen in a major production in years. Mm. And it just takes you so completely out of the film that you look at the time and realize it's only been 40 minutes. Mm, mm, okay. I'm seeing starting to see where this is where this and is you've going. You've got work the next day, but you've got to finish the movie cuz everyone's talking about it. Uh-huh. Well, uh I have you know, I have a potential prescription for that. I mean, like there's other films that kind of, you know, touch on a very similar sort of themology, if you will. Uh as as far as just being a child and being kind of alone and afraid. Uh, another film that came out this year called He's Watching. I don't know if you. Uh, oh know. yeah, you know I actually saw that. It was it was really interesting because it's on Tubi, um, which is an incredible platform, and it's just called He's Watching, and it's got like a scary guy in a mask on the cover, and all the reviews on Letterboxd are like the most annoying kind of horror person being mad. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't taken a look at that, but that oh. It's very funny. Um, yeah, no, I saw that one, and it was really r compelling watching it back to back with, with Skinema Rink because I noticed that, like, they're both kind of in the same... They're both kind of from the school of, like, cinema-tackling internet horror uh -huh. as, like, a genre, like, a, like the, the sort of taking the tropes and, like, language and ideas of it. Um, and one of them does it really, really well, and the other one uh, doesn't. And it's the one that uh, everyone's talking about that I thought did it really badly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so maybe we can kind of put a finer point on this things. I don't want to I don't want to take too much time uh, kind of during your session, uh, you know, kind of citing my own experiences. I've seen both movies and I'm kind of amazed at how opposite and, op and opposing the experience was for each film. Whereas with, with Skinema Rink, I really, really wanted to be on its side and really wanted to like it um, and didn't. Uh, whereas with He's Watching, I felt kind of averse to it at first and I, I didn't want to really be on its side, but something about it kind of won me over. Did you go through kind of like a similar process there? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's what's interesting is that Skinema Rink has like everything going for it not just in terms of like everybody loving it that was actually a mark against it but <laughs> it has everything going for it and that it's serving up so much food it's such the kind of approach to stuff that i like of horror that i love its use of images is great there's a lot of like dense meaning that you can project onto like how one projects onto the dark yes and then it just kept routinely like smacking it out of my hand in a way that kind of like wasn't just oh there were some flaws i didn't like but which kind of made me like the things i liked a lot less mm. because it ends up feeling more like an accident <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely it's, it's that weird thing where it's the the glaring imperfections end up damning it much harsher than if it was a mixed bag whereas he's watching being a mixed bag ends up really lifting it because it ends up being just really charming that this 
very amateur, clearly made by a film family in quarantine film, uh, does a lot of really cool, fun things with that. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe, maybe should we start maybe with, with Skinema Rink and, and dissecting the beast and ending explaining it? I think so. I think kind of uh, it'll be a good kind of illustration in terms of how things uh, or, or maybe maybe a lesson, you know, for us to learn and for, you know, for for future for for the future to kind of learn how pre- how to present something. Uh, because yeah. there's a lot of issues here <laughs> with with uh, Skin of Ink, I feel like. Uh, well, one thing that I want to kind of bring up just so I don't forget is um, did you see the like film festival intro that the director for Skin of Ink recorded? No, that played before me. the movie. No, I need to know. Um, <laughs> what is it? I, <laughs> I don't want to spend too much time on this, but it's so fucking funny. I, <laughs> it's literally him staring into the camera being like, I cannot guarantee that you will like this movie. <laughs> but what I do guarantee is that you will be up awake all night tonight, too scared to even go to the bathroom and get a glass of water. You will be pissing and shitting from the hours of midnight to 5 a.m. as though you are playing Five Nights at Freddy's. I, I, I don't know. It was, It just, it was like a vaguely similar tone to like the film itself, which is fine. But when you kind of consider that the film, the, like the big jump scares of the film that it kind of, hinges itself on uh are like hey i just got adobe photoshop cs5 woohoo yeah. <laughs> like it's um yeah i don't know it it, it kind of cheapens something about it it's there there's something to be said about the fact that like both people who loved and hated this film will compare it to five nights at freddy's <laughs> um yeah that's really funny because not only did I not have any trouble falling asleep, I actually slept great. <laughs> I had, and I had, I like, had trouble not falling asleep. Yeah, I had some like pretty cool dreams, didn't have any real nightmares, woke up feeling like pretty refreshed in that way that like only getting really mad at something can. <laughs> <laughs> well, it gave me specifically that feeling where like I have I have such a problem with horror where I I really like being scared of a of a movie, um, but it's happened so so infrequently, especially as I've gotten older. Uh, I think like the last time I the last time I truly truly felt scared by a movie might have been either like Noroi the Curse or like Blair Witch. God, uh, Noroi is so good. Noroi is fantastic. It's a great movie. Um, and, and, you know, there's other movies where, like, I get unsettled and stuff like that. But that's kind of a different story. Like, I, I, I want to feel scared. And, yeah. And Skin of Marink had so much atmosphere that it's, like, it's kind of teasing you. And it's, like, you're, fe- you're like, on the on the verge of, like, okay, this is, you know, there's there's an atmosphere happening here. Um, but that's also such a tenuous place for a horror film to be because it, it can fumble the bag really, really hard. Yeah, I I think the other thing about it, too, is because people are talking like, oh, this is the scariest film. And I'm not downplaying anyone for whom it was scary, but that kind of does set a different expectation. Whereas the things I liked about this film the most aren't really the scary things. It's the like cockiness of the approach of how to tell the story. Yeah, it's 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 the aesthetic. It's the making your movie literally just Every I I, I said this other box. Instead of every frame a painting, every frame is a witch house album cover. (laughs) Uh, Just like it, it just shows a real good understanding of like that mood and of like what makes that kind of imagery unsettling. It doesn't always stick the landing. You know, there's kind of only so many times where I'm looking at like the baseboards of a house where I'm like, I don't. Like, I I think the biggest thing this film was missing is that the thing that's super scary when you're a kid about a house at night and dark is corners. Yes. There were, like, no corners in this film. That was, like, really weird to me. And that that is kind of one of the things that sort of, like, made me go a little, like, 
like are people maybe giving this film a bit too much credit because right. it's like I feel like that's like an obvious one, right? Is that like if part of your thing is that like not being able to see things clearly or like possibly imagining things being there, not knowing if they really are, corners are like a give. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's money on the table. That's yeah. yeah, that's money on the table. And like you already have a house that's changing shape and like disappearing and appearing things. Like, why not have it become full of corners? Right. Just Photoshop some corners in there. <laughs> you, photosh- you already have Photoshop open. Just fucking do it. Yeah. It, it, very funny every time, uh, even through the fake, the digitally added in post film grain uh, mm-hmm. and the, the blurriness that there would still be so many shots that'd be like, look at this hallway that's going on really long. And I'd be like, yeah, look at that pattern that's repeating in the way that using the clone tool causes. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Yeah, look at the... Uh, uh, you're, really, you're really content aware replaced that window, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Well, and, and and kind of the other trouble is, like, I, I don't know, I'm a little I'm a little spoiled insofar as um, I was also a huge fan of Marble Hornets uh, when it first dropped, like, season one. Yeah. That uh, kind of was something that actually scared me, and that, that was kind of, like, where I kind of expelled all my energy like when when a new marble hornets video would drop and i would freak out and i would like go frame by frame and like see like what can you see in the background you know what what is what are all these shapes like is is that something that's happening there or am i just seeing something what what is that kind of thing and i think skinnamarink wants you to do that um and part of what it employs to m- to make that happen is this really artificial looking noise filter that I-, I didn't have too much of a problem with but it definitely like was not you know like very realistic uh it, w- it was it was really it was d- it was distracting sometimes um I mean, not to not to fucking trash on the movie the whole time i thought there were some scares that were great i thought the mom slowly disappearing was crazy uh, and very yeah, simple, very simple. I thought effect. that was a really good one. Yeah, um, I I'm trying to get some examples of scares that worked. Uh, the I, I wish you didn't have the stupid scream, but the 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 phone face in the dark being like these super vivid eyes, and then it's just the phone. Yeah. But then the eyes move, and the light goes back off, and it's like these like clearly different eyes. I thought that was really good and unsettling. Um, the face at the end of the film is really good. I, um, God, there were some other ones that I'm now blanking on offhand. Um, the, the sort of initial, uh, voice occasionally just like emptying out into this empty house and the kids either like ignoring it, which implies that they sort of immediately understand that it's dangerous or trying to interact with it in a very naive way Yeah, was good. Um, even just stuff like some of the shots of like things clinging to walls and ceilings in ways that don't make sense was good. Um, I guess that's it. I did like the looping TV. I liked the looping TV bit. That was that was fun. Yeah, that was all right. Um, but you're giving all of this stuff, and it just becomes really obvious early on that there's nothing there. Right. And if there's nothing there. I'm not really going to be like straining to look at the dark or like straining to figure out what I'm looking at because the movie pretty early on teaches you that if it wants you to notice something, it's going to fucking yell at you. (laughs) You're going to hear a very Uh, loud noise. Which is partially why I really, like I said, it's like I, I didn't find this movie scary. I find it really like visually interesting and cocky. I like telling this narrative in the way where you, the audience member have to actively be trying to piece together, like what's going on and what you're looking at. Yeah. And like what you're hearing, you know, like craning your neck almost to figure out where the sounds are coming from. Uh, Stuff like that, I think is really, really cool. And I think engages the viewer in a way that works really well for the style and would work really well for horror. If it backed that up with like, any more ideas or execution than like mommy sick <laughs> blood splatter blood splatter 
uh, face uh, face smears, face smear. Ooh, spooky photos. What if you're looking at a door frame and then all of a sudden, ooh, a hand shows up in the door frame and it is loud. And it's really loud, which is also funny because it's like, and then it straight up plays the like, the like modern analog horror, like the Walton files or whatever that shit is called on mm. YouTube thing, where it's like loud noise and then like static, like the film got interrupted. And it's like, when it did that, I was like, that's not even, that's not even what's happening in this film. Like, like <laughs> the reason that works in analog horror stuff is because in theory, you're watching like corrupted, demonic, possessed, like work like uh like office tapes or whatever like you're watching some sort of video or like an instructional or something and then this like ooh spooky creepy stuff starts intruding in but it's like not what's happening here so why did it do that what was that staticky noise about yeah is it just that's the noise that you associate with scary thing happened <laughs> because it didn't work here it took me it literally took me straight out of the film and like burned so much goodwill it had that for the rest of the film i was just like desperately trying to get that back and every time there'd be something that i was like able to latch onto and really like it would do another stupid scare like that or it would just like kind of shrug its shoulders and be like um and then his toy disappears i don't know <laughs> ah. and then and, and then the voice is like Stab yourself in the eye. Wouldn't that be fucked up if that happened to a kid? That would be so scary. Uh, which brings me to a much bigger mistake I made for this film. Oh. So I had heard that, uh -huh. you know, actually, uh, this is this is tangential but related. The static thing reminded me a lot of the thing in Sensor, where at the end there's like the creepy pasta like intrusion of like she's in this fake like idyllic like happy film ending, and then it like there's like a cut of like oh everything's dark and like the family screaming and she's covered in blood, and then it cuts back to that thing, and I was like that like is not as a genre trope of 80s video nasties, which is this allegedly is a is a tribute to. <laughs> Yeah. Uh that is modern analog horror bullshit. Um and it reminded me of that of just like, oh, do you like not even know like what you're drawing on anymore? Like do you <laughs> not really get the images? Um so I and much like how Sensor uh had a short film that Sensor was that was kind of a test concept of it that when I watched made it obvious to me that when this person wanted to make a movie about video nasties, what they actually meant was that they wanted to uh, make a movie adaptation of Puppet Combo, but I've never watched an 80s horror film. Mm. Um, and like with this one, Hack, uh, which was the short film that basically became Skinamo Rink, um, was pitched to me as like, it's better because it's like much more condensed, so it doesn't have as much of the pacing issues. Right. And it was fun watching it because you could kind of see like really amateurish versions of the same visual tricks and designs. I liked a lot of the stuff there. Or I didn't like a lot of stuff there, but it made me like really appreciate how much his strength over the imagery and the use of sound in Skinema Rink became. Mm. Um, and it also made me realize that he uh, is that kind of horror guy <laughs> because <laughs> uh, in Heck, it's about 20 minutes long. It's sort of the same thing, but it's like one kid. He's like trying to get his mom to talk to him because um, like she's not around. Uh, he like cleans his room and he's like, Mom, I cleaned my room. She doesn't come out. He can't find her. There's just this TV that's always blurring cartoons. He he colors in the, in the carpet and is like, I'm coloring on the carpet. Just like doing all this stuff. He can't leave his house because the doors won't open. Uh, pretty, pretty all right stuff. Uh, and then about like halfway through, uh, he goes, Mom, I'm sorry I got cancer. Oh, come on. And then he finds his mom and she has the same blur face technique thing on her mouth. And then there's like, it, it does the same thing I hated in Skinamarink, where Skinamarink goes like 570 days later. And it's like, okay, cool. The, the, <laughs> the sense of not time passing in this and feeling really weird and outside of time, you just fucking pissed all over and was like, actually, it's been like two years. Yeah. Uh, she does that like every 30 seconds in, in Hack, where it's like 500 sleeps later, 
it's 81,000 sleeps later. Um, and so, like, you're shown a shot where it implies that, like, the mom killed herself because her kid died of cancer. And so the mom and the kid are there. And it's, like, all these, like, creepy, boring images. And then, like, the last line of the film is just the kid uh, at the end of, like, amount of sleeps that, like, I did the math or, like, I, someone on Reddit did the math on. And they're like, oh, that means the kid has been trapped here for 51 years. Uh, the last line of the film is the kid going, mommy, I think we're in hell. <laughs> I... which is like so I like literally burst out laughing when I, saw that, <laughs> when I heard that line just like you named the movie heck like I already got it I already got the point you had a the kid say sorry I got cancer <laughs> like I I get it yeah <laughs> you don't oh. need to. I I want to make a horror movie that's just like the uh, it's just like black text on a white background and it just says scared and it just <laughs> it just flashes and it's like scared scared you're scared you're scared you're scared you're scared I, it's just black text on a back background and it just says like uh molested child <laughs> jesus <laughs> uh uh coma <laughs> coma 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 death 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 just the word death uh, over and over it's all in their head whoa, whoa. <laughs> Um, and that made me hate Skinamarink more <laughs> because <laughs> what it made me realize is that the opening bit where the kid falls down the stairs, um, I had interpreted as being like a very kind of like, like moment of tragedy before the storm situation. And sort of, I, I took it as like what the film is kind of working with is this textural feeling of like a kid, like a kid's first memories of when they became aware that like danger exists. Yeah. Yeah. The kid is first becomes aware that like their home could become unsafe. Um, the, the stuff with some of the mom and dad implying like the, the kid's first awareness that like mom and dad are there. They, there's a, a person out. There's a level to them that is beyond your comprehension and is like scary and uncertain. You know, like whether that's mental illness or like personal conflict, that the the world can hurt you, that like there can be somebody who wants to do bad things to you. This this sort of childlike understanding and inability to understand these things and how they became like horrifying in a kid's mind. And so I took that opening scene where he falls down the stairs as like that, you know, like for most kids, like falling down the stairs when you're like four years old, that's the thing you remember because it's probably like the first time you experience like something super painful and scary. Um, right. But yeah, then that's... watching Heck, I realized, oh, the kid's just in a coma. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. it's just a stupid YouTube explained thing. It, it uh, The kid's dead or he's in a coma and like all of this stuff that's supposed to be vague and difficult to understand actually is supposed to be a dumb gay little puzzle for you to solve. <laughs> and it pissed me the fuck off because I was just like, great. <laughs> that's why people like this movie because it's begging for a video essay. Oh God. That's, that's really infuriating because I, I had given it the benefit of the doubt that it was just kind of this art peace project that wasn't really trying to do like an ash ketchum is in a coma thing right like that's what i liked about it so much and it's because it's like even like that because it's like it it immediately explained like oh that's why there's all the like the weird shit at the end of the film that like feels a little like over the top like the kid getting murdered again and again with different voices screaming uh -huh. it's it, it it immediately contextualized all the like stuff in the movie that like kind of came out of left field was it's like oh you took all the wrong lessons from like youtube horror yeah absolutely i mean i don't know it, it's i kind of i kind of think that sucks i majorly think that sucks um i also like I, it's something that I came away from the movie not really like thinking about that like that that's that's almost a point in its favor um but I kind of see the writing on the wall there and I just don't I I don't know I don't think that's cool I don't think that's very clever yeah no and it, it's not because like 
the in in air quotes the film's favor i think having that stuff that like in your design for the film makes sense because it gives you a groundwork so that the scares and everything you're building towards have an internal logic to them yeah you know you 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 don't fall into that the the mistake of just kind of throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks you have an internal logic that you've come up with for the film where it's like okay here's what's going on so that way i i have a sense of like what makes sense within this universe i've done so that the audience gets a sense that there are rules and that there are logic to this it's just that the rules and logic are inscrutable to the audience and to the child and that's what makes it scary it's the same reason why the early hellraisers are so good is because clearly there's like a a lore to the hellraisers but you're not shown it so you have no way of knowing what it is Mm -hmm. um so watching that just immediately made me realize oh god he put all the pieces there and it, that is why the film ends up feeling like he's just throwing thing at the, everything at the wall to stick because it's just a, a ratcheting level of like, man, filming all those walls was a lot of work. <laughs> it would be so fucked up if like a kid died. <laughs> like, yeah, it would. I guess so. That's not why your movies. That's not that's not why the movie's scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know, like. I, I usually go I go for stuff like this all the time. I love slow cinema. I I'm, I go crazy for it. I love artsy fartsy stuff. I love um you know the the trauma horror thing that everybody insists is like this huge genre that is completely washed away the 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 hegemonic uh, horror film. Uh, people keep insisting that's the only type of horror film that's getting made. Um, uh, I, I'm, I, I'm into so that stuff. I, I, yeah, it, it is a thing of like, I, I'm constantly in this territory of just like, of like, I, I both think that like, there's that specific style of, of trauma horror that people complain about is really annoying and that I want to, and like, I make fun of it all the time, uh. but also people who like, stake their entire like yeah i'm a real horror fan reputation on it are just as annoying That's so fucking cringe because <laughs> it's like the shit that you like is also like would also be fucking annoying if that was like most of the films being made like shut the fuck up like it's, it's... <laughs> bro imagine when the shi- like the shining came out and people being like i'm sick of all this trauma horror or yeah. like hasn't horror always been trauma horror like i'm like fucking crazy i i, I think it's because like some people have mistaken that critique of the problem is that like a lot of trauma horror is like too didactic and too obvious about it yeah. for like therefore a horror film shouldn't have trauma in it as all and it's like no like I shut th- up i think the problem you have is that you don't like it when things aren't good and i can, yeah. i can <laughs> totally totally understand that i'm in agreement with that I think the problem is that you're a fan of horror, a genre quite literally in American history defined by the fact that when something is successful, everybody rips it off for like seven years. Yeah, (laughs) you know, ask me, ask me how I feel about people kind of making very thinly veiled uh, swipes at Jordan Peele. Yeah, you know, like, like, oh, okay, yeah, you're right. If it, I yeah you're right we should go back to when horror was good like when every movie was ripping off scream or when every movie was ripping off nightmare on elm street or when every movie was ripping off friday the 13th yeah like that's just horror dude like i don't know what to tell you like yeah most of it sucks that's horror (laughs) most (laughs) things suck most things that people make are bad most people spend a lot of their time making something that you put in your mouth and go patooey (laughs) (laughs) Like, what's what's it like to not be alienated by 95% of all media that's ever been created? Uh, yeah. Especially stuff popular with people. Jesus Christ. Oh, my fucking God. You people have no idea what you're doing. Uh, well, whatever. Skinamarink, yeah, it it's, um, has this sort of pretension about it. Has this sort of, uh, this, this, this kind of insistence on like some level of craft but then when it kind of falls apart when you see the when you see the machinations uh kind of in contrast to another little old movie he's watching he's watching yeah um 
shout outs to friend of the podcast Lonnie for being the one to recommend it to me. Shout out Lonnie. Uh, by jokingly referring to it as Damon Packard's uh, <laughs> cinema rank. <laughs> I, th- it is though and that's what makes it yeah. that's what makes it great <laughs> that's what makes it great so uh much as skin rink takes the wrong lessons from analog horror uh sorry you can't do pet scop um yeah, pet scop is so good no, though no, i was just like fucking no one can right? no one can <laughs> do pet scop let's get one thing like no one can touch pet scop yeah Catos- catastrophe crow you were fine you're no pet scop you're pushing it you're pushing, You're pushing it, Catastrophe it. Crow. No, honestly, I, Catastrophe Crow was way... Catastrophe Crow is like a, a, another great, uh, like, basically, uh, another great case in, like, taking something a little bit too far. Like, taking it to a point where it's hard to take seriously. Whereas yeah, no, Petscop is a masterpiece. Petscop is a masterpiece. It knows when to say things and when to tell you things and, like, when to give you puzzles to solve and when not to. And Catastrophe Crow is just, like... Solve my story. Spoiler alert: It's about a kid that died again. <laughs> Honestly, watching like Skinnerink and he's watching back to back just reminded me of just like how good like good internet horror is. Yeah, honestly, um, which is why I found his watching really charming because you you brought up Marble Hornets earlier. It reminds me of stuff like that. It reminds me of stuff like um, No Through Road was another one I, I rewatched recently. Like it's like a like from 13 years ago, like one of the first, like kind of like just teenagers making a little horror film on YouTube out of like driving up and down a UK road and pretending that they're trapped on the same road over and over again. That's smart. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really well, it's like really well made. It's like a tight 10 minute film. Uh There's, there's this sort of like practical, like horror where it, like it nestles in really nicely next to like all of the like con like, vlogs slice of life content like let's plays with pet scop you know like a, a lot of that stuff shows a really good clever awareness of like what do people do with cameras or like the technology to record things and then what if you introduce an element of like uh of something outside their control yes and yeah. i think he's watching draws on that a lot because it's not a found footage film (laughs) kind of a found footage film it's so that's one thing that i find so interesting about he's watching right is that it kind of it it starts out and it's like very much a found footage film and then all of this there's all of these other shots where uh like it's it feels very fictionalized um and it feels it kind of does the almost like the pulse thing like that one scene in pulse where like she kind of goes in and like uh there's like someone there's somehow a camera feed of the room behind people know what scene i'm talking about that, yeah that yeah, one no, scary the, scene the, in the, pulse. The, they're being recorded by a camera but there's no camera there uh and they i like that he's watching starts to introduce that really early on where there's a shot from inside a bathroom of the girl peeking her head around so you think she would see whatever's in there and yeah. that cuts to her perspective. And then as she comes around, there's nothing there. Yeah. And so it creates this unsettling thing of like, is the person or thing recording her like hiding? But then you're like, but where the fuck could it be hiding? Like there's nothing, there's nowhere to hide in here. And it just sort of increasingly does that where it's like, you just start seeing like two angles from characters that aren't in the room looking in the same, like looking basically at each other and so neither camera is catching catching the presence of another person filming but it's also intercut with like the footage that the kids themselves are are filming yes yeah and then it has like the like the fucking mind blowing things where it's like there will be like a scene where it starts with like the kids recording it and then there's those angles from something else recording it and then there'll be a shot that's from a different angle of someone else recording them and then it pulls out a little bit and something else is recording that footage off of the tv screen yeah yeah (laughs) and then it cuts to another angle and you're no longer on the tv screen so there's like just multiple layers of these like diegetic non-diegetic cameras because introducing this footage being on a tv screen means that that footage is being captured and broadcasted somehow, but is someone recording the TV screen? <laughs> right, right. Uh, and and what I found so interesting about that is that like there are some there are kind of some vague textures here, and he's watching about child exploitation that I feel like a lot of mixed ways about that we can definitely get into, uh, get yes. into get into the weeds of talking about that. But um, like it 
implicates the audience in like a very clear way where it's like, oh, you know, you think that this is like kind of switching between found footage and not found footage, but it kind of is all found footage in the sense that like something malicious is recording them and it's, you know, you, but you had to like put yourself in the place as like the viewer of this like not found footage footage, but it is found footage. So like you're the bad guy kind of. Or you are viewing... implicated in the pact that the film represents, basically. Yes, yes, a hundred percent. Um, and yeah, and and that is that is such a texture there of, of of like the the child exploitation, the kind of like uh, I I don't know if it was so pronounced, but there was definitely like a vague feeling of just like stop putting your fucking kids on TikTok that that the movie oh. was trying to say. Oh yeah, definitely a degree of like stop trying to make your kids famous. Also, definitely a degree of like surveillance like constant surveillance of parents because it's like oh they're still being surveilled and recorded constantly which they're obviously familiar with but now there suddenly is an awareness of the fact that the parents are completely absent yes uh yeah. so, so to because to, i'm sure people listening to this haven't haven't seen it yet you should it's it's, it's a pretty pretty quick watch it's pretty fun yep um uh, it, it the premise of the film is that these two kids, brother and sister, who are the director's IRL kids, and they're all, including the director, playing themselves. Um, or I guess loosely themselves. I don't know if they ever actually give their last names, but it's all the same first names. Mm-hmm. Um, are, are making this video diary because their parents are in the hospital. And as the film goes on, it kind of like at first teases that it's like, oh, it's like COVID. It's like a COVID film. And then it's like, no, actually, this isn't COVID. It's like a, a possibly world ending disease. Yeah, it's, it's it's way worse than COVID. And kids are just for whatever reason immune to it. Very funny thing to draw on, by the way, from the COVID <laughs> stuff. Um, and the kids like. At the start of the film, they're making it for them. And it's implied that they've been talking with their parents, but then they end up like almost immediately. It it becomes they're sending this footage to their parents and their parents are seeing it because they're getting the red receipts back, but they're not replying to it. Yeah, that and was kids, really interesting. The kids leave their house, but they can't really go anywhere because no one wants to have kids in because the implication is that kids can be carriers of the disease, but aren't affected by it. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're sort of isolated and alienated from all their neighbors and from their parents. There's implication that, like, the government is kind of, like, you know, coming by to do wellness checks and assumedly, like, bring food and stuff. Um, and the kids are going stir-crazy. They're starting to fight. They're starting to blame each other for this weird shit that's going on around the house. And then they start receiving um, video that we've been seeing in the rest of the film, video that we had assumed was non-diegetic like camera footage inserted into it Uh they start getting texted that footage and so they become aware that somebody's been filming them in their house and also they start to become aware that the person filming them in the house is doing so in a way that is impossible (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. uh and yeah that uh, you 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 saying all that stuff did kind of remind me though and this is just like one one thing and we can get back to what we're actually talking about but did you see the shot during kind of the end credits where there was like a MAGA guy who was like holding a gun and wearing a face mask? Uh, that was probably the most implausible part of the movie because I think that guy would probably, <laughs> that guy would probably be mask off asking people to open mouth cough into his mouth. Um, yeah, no, that's that. That was almost definitely. Th- there's the cute thing in the opening credits of uh, where they think they're na- like they're they're like oh with help from our neighbors and stuff. So I assumed all of the outside world adult footage was them basically like asking their neighbor friends, who are probably also involved in the film industry in various ways. Yeah, uh, like hey, like, record something and send it to us for this. And so that was probably that guy's idea. Which is funny because the thing you end up seeing is that a lot of people's when given the sort of prompt of like. Show yourself dead of a pandemic. Um, the only thing they could think of is, I fell downstairs. <laughs> it's just a lot of like, oh, that guy fell down the stairs. Oh, that guy also fell down the stairs. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, like one thing, one thing that I'll say for my part, uh, as far as he's watching, it's not like I was crazy um, impressed by it, or it's not like I thought it was like this great new statement of 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 the horror genre uh but 
that's kind of the thing about it is that it has so much less pretension around it than Skin of Marink, and it has so much less, like, I don't know, it, it, it's not trying to impress you necessarily, it's just trying to tell a story. Uh, and that instantly made me, like, way more willing to uh, be forgiving of the literal, like, worse than Skin of Marink level jump scares that occur in He's Watching. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, there's one shot of like a woman who, like, she ger- she she's playing the piano scarily, and then she turns around and she screams at the daughter, but the mouth is covering her face and it's sideways, and it looks really, it looks really stupid and dumb. Uh, and and it, it is the most like mom, like the most like cliche horror scene. Yeah, absolutely. But it, but it feels genuine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like it works like, better. That's, that's like. Like so, it's like yeah, that's like a dumb scare, but like I'm I'm having fun and enjoying the film in exactly. the way that I enjoy like amateur YouTube horror stuff, and that's basically what it feels like. Is that the dad was probably like, I assume the kids probably are super into amateur horror stuff because like they definitely as actors seem like super on board with the movie. Like you could tell that they are having fun, especially early on in the film. Yeah. Um, and honestly, like I feel like there's a decent chance that a chunk of the film is like written slash improv by them because it kind of has that vibe, which I, I appreciate just in the same way that like how Sue is written by a kid. Like I, I like seeing what a, what a teen and like preteens ideas of horror is. If you gave them kind of more free reign to do what they want with it. Right. Right. Uh, even if it does also include really goofy shit, like the closet creeper. The closet creeper. It, hey, I'm the closet creeper. What if there was a naked guy outside your house and he had a funny animal mask on? <laughs> and I mean, that's kind of like, that's part of the fundamental difference in, this, in these movies and a, a fundamental thing to kind of talk about when we're talking about the creation of horror, um, which is like, if your goal is to, if, if your sole goal in creating a, a film is to scare people and you fall short of that goal uh then you have nothing (laughs) but if you have kind of a double-pronged goal of like well i would love to scare people but first let's make sure that we're telling a story yeah Uh, i I think you're in a much better place uh which is not to say that skin ring doesn't necessarily tell a story but it's just so much so much looser and so much more about the imagery and so much more about the atmosphere whereas he's watching he's watching tells a story that i find like you know divorced from the movie interesting and and also it's you know it 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 paces itself well it it kind of like it chugs along decently um but kind of the aspect of it that's that's about this kind of vague sort of child sacrifice that has that also has to do with like the film industry um you know it, it has something to say the kids definitely approach it uh, in the like internet horror thing of like, okay, we have to like figure out like what this all means and solves it. Um, but a thing that I really like about it is that they come to an answer that seems to be about correct and seems to like be true, but that they admit even in the text of the film that like they're kind of just making stabs in the dark. And I really like that. Like I like that there's imagery that is introduced that the kids just don't have an explanation for. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Uh, because it, it, impl- it, you know, it's the thing I mentioned before. It's like, it implies that there's a lore and that there's a larger unknownness to this that, like, the kids can't, can kind of feel the shape of, but they can't, they can't grasp it enough to really, like, understand it. And, like, that alone just shows, like, a pretty, s- up shows a better understanding of what's scary than Skinamarink does. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there There's a lot of, there's a lot of ghouls and goblins and he's watching yeah they're really they're really fun goblins <laughs> <laughs> they look very goofy and are not scary but they are very fun i like that there's just a clown yeah <laughs> i like that there's just uh their dad but red <laughs> <laughs> right yeah and, and but i mean like I, that's something kind of cool and kind of like reminiscent of childhood scary stuff is just like oh you see something in your in your dad's office and you don't understand it i mean like that's got to be such a film industry thing right of just like oh yeah no that makes a lot of sense yeah i saw especially when their dad makes horror films both in the movie and in like real life <laughs> yeah absolutely that's 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 very that feels lived in 
Uh, but I, I, it's also very funny that like a lot of the uh, ghouls, ghosties, the, the the freaks in this film are just like holding up a phone camera and like filming them. Uh, yeah, I like it's freaky. It, it's also funny. It's 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 very funny, and it definitely feeds into that like uncomfortable idea of surveillance. I think, like you said, the like stop putting your kids on TikTok. You don't know who's looking at them kind of a thing yeah yeah um i i I definitely like that i i like how the film i like that the demon in the film sort of operates on this logic of just like double or nothing (laughs) (laughs) your dad gave me two kids in exchange for one kid i want four kids (laughs) (laughs) yeah that stuff was I, i i don't know there there was um I, I don't know, like the the deal aspect of it was was very very interesting, and the way it kind of ends with uh, them being relinquished, the 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 family kind of coming back together because they they make this like deal with the devil essentially. Yeah, uh, the the lead up there was the lead up there was all right, but yeah, two movies, neither of them particularly scary, but uh, just a, a wonderful case study and presentation. Yes. Uh, I I will say, as much as I ragged on Skin and Moring here, I will probably go see whatever movie the guy does next, because at the very least, he has a strong command of visual style. Uh-huh. I, I'll see that again. Maybe the third time will be the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> it'll all click. It'll make sense. It'll be like, oh, shit, that kid's in a coma. That's actually really scary and fucked up. Oh, I was thinking maybe he'll just learn to stop because uh, like he did he did the annoying things in heck a little less here. Maybe he'll <laughs> <laughs> maybe next time he'll he'll just stop being annoying and yeah. just be good. Uh, you know, we there's always hope in. Uh, but either way. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Maybe it's best to I, I don't know, as my kind of as my therapy advice, maybe it's best to kind of lean off the lay off the horror for a little bit it's it's you know it can kind of it can kind of scramble you a little bit yeah no i i I guess ultimately you know you have to learn how to how to accept the past yeah you know live with it accept it uh and and don't put knives in your eyes that seems to be uh where that kid really messed up try try not doing that yeah like i don't know I, I would simply not, you know, stab myself in the eye, but that's kind of just me. Yeah, honestly, don't know why he took advice from that guy. Yeah. <laughs> <That> was... <laughs> not a very Seems like a poor choice. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Kids, you know, kids got to learn, you know, it's it's like a stranger danger kind of thing. Just don't, if someone tells you to put a knife in your eye, if all your friends are putting knives in their eye, would you do it? Well, maybe at that point I would do it. I don't know. Yeah, I'd probably do it. I mean, the problem is like none of his friends are doing it. Yeah, he's just kind of being a weird, a weird little loner. He's trying to kind of like start something new, like hey, hey, a new fad, new trick, new fad. dance move for TikTok. <laughs> oh, that's the new TikTok dance craze. Is uh, do the, it for the vine. Yeah, the the eye stab. <laughs> 